If you're new to this, essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you all the information that I have gathered on cybernetics. It's a pretty exciting field. Um, and you can ask me questions here, ask me on Twitter, but I kind of am working through it a little bit at a time. But I can see your questions more readily on Periscope. So let's talk about the science of cybernetics. Hello everyone who's joined. So what is cybernetics? Essentially, it is communications and automatic control systems. And the thing is, it's not really such a pure science on its own anymore. It's have, it has evolved into other disciplines. So it's pretty groovy what's going on with it. Now customarily, what most people associate with cy cybernetics is that we see it in movies. We see all of these different types of interface in regards to movies. So we have the Matrix. We have the Borg. That's scary. That's like human machine putting together, you know. So we've seen it in the Borg. We've seen it in the Matrix. And we've also seen it in downloading information to the brain in Johnny Mnemonic, which is kind of cool. We've also seen it in Doctor Who as the Cybermen you know, cybernetics in that regard, and also the very scary Skynet as Terminator 2, you know, or Terminator 1, whichever one you particularly prefer. So we've seen it there. Now let's talk about the history of cybernetics. There's a dude that's considered the father of cybernetics. He is Norbert Wiener. <laughs> he was born November 26, 1894 in Columbia, Missouri, passed away in 1964 in Sweden, he was considered a child prodigy who is also an American mathematician. So he got his start primarily in mathematics, but he was really interested in um, formulating some kind of easier way to kind of deal with human communications. So he formulated some of the most important contributions to mathematics in the 20th century. So let's look at what he did. This is a pretty groovy book that he had. It's a publication that used to be secret, especially during World War II. So what he, essentially this particular work did um, was it was circulated as a secret document in order to enhance radar systems and so it addressed aiming gunfire at a moving target. So it introduced certain statistical methods into control and communications in it, through engineering and it exerted great influences in these particular areas. So combining these ideas from statistics and time series analysis Wiener used Gauss's method of shaping these characteristics of a detector to allow for the maximal recognition of, shape of signals in the presence of noise. So essentially, when you're getting all these signals in, how can you determine which is the target that you want? So if you're in any kind of computational type of research, whether it's computer science or not, you should be familiar with what's called the Wiener signal or the Wiener filter. <laughs> we don't have one of those, I guess, for the internet for us, we, for ladies. That's a tongue-in-cheek joke. Sorry about that. I couldn't resist. But this is also the work that led towards his concept of cybernetics. So the next book that he published, all right, I promise this is going to get interesting, but we got to cover a little bit of the history, you know what I mean? So cybernetics or the control and communication in the animal and the machine. So cybernetics comes from the Greek word for governor, governor being a controller of sorts. It is used today in a lot of control theory, automation theory, computer programs, and the thing about this cybernetics theory is that it reduces the time-consuming computations that humans normally do in these decision-making processes. So we see these applications used in quantum theory as well as computational science and science-based um, theoretical models. All right, so here we got another gift. <laughs> this definition of cybernetics closely resembles that in regards to um, in regards to these theoretical models when you look at the central nervous system all right so we have the controller which is like the human brain we have the monitor which are the eyes all right so 
let's take a scenario to where you, a person, you're using your monitor, which is your eyes, to be able to see the distance of picking up something. Now your controller, your brain is going to take what feedback your eyes give to dole out some instructions. Should I move my hand forward more? Should I pull it back more? In order to grab a particular item. Now we see this also with the claw experiment. You know, we have Spock here who's trying really hard. He's using his monitor, his eyes, and he's got his controller the brain or trying to determine the instructions in order to get the teddy bear to drop you know and of course he doesn't get it so he gets angry so we have a bit of human error here that kind of plays a role so cybernetics kind of removes a little bit of this human error and so this with the basics of the feedback issues that we have here we have computers to help rule that out a bit which is kind of fun now this is a very, very noisy looking GIF. It wasn't like this when I tried initially. All right. <laughs> so let me try to work out what this is going on here for you. So this is what we call a 2D simulation of the particle in a box experiment. So if you're familiar with Schrodinger, Schrodinger said, you know, there's a particle in, in a box. You should be able to detect it at any point. Well, if we use the 1D model, there's areas where we can't detect a particle. But if we use the 2D model and we put in those equations and let the computers do it for us, given an X and Y coordinate, we can get in more of an opportunity to detect these particular particles within a box. So the more, you know, then you got like, the more you know where a particle is, the less you are to know where it is, you know, that sort of thing. But with the 2D model, we're able to have better detection systems. So let's talk about computational chemistry and how that works with that. So I'm gonna to get to instrumentation in a bit. So I'll talk a bit about how to detect that with instrumentation, it'll be a bit easier. Boy guys, you pick like cybernetics and there's like nine billion things about it. So <laughs> bear with me. So computational chemistry over here in the bottom corner, that would be a protein, all right? And so with cybernetics, we're able to take a protein in a living system and determine what it looks like without having to actually go in and look. We can have it interact with other mo molecules. We can see how it interacts with those sorts of things through computational methods. Cybernetics allows us these calculations to where we can see how they interact without actually having to spend a lot of money in a lab figuring out on that end. But we do need that in experimentation. But if we're able to determine which compounds fit in this protein through a computer simulation, that saves us a bit of money. So that's one aspect of cybernetics in regards to interface in order to calculate things on a quicker means where we can apply it in a wet lab. So that's computational. Now let's get to instrumentation. If you want to detect anything in a sample, doesn't matter what it is. This is one example here, UV Viz. I'll talk about this in a second. But if we want to figure out what's in a particular sample of water, if we want to find protein in a living system, look for a particular thing, detect a bacteria, but detect a virus, find out somebody's pregnant. All of this regards is is you we use instrumentation in that regard. So essentially we're taking something. We're converting it into a digital signal. This digital signal is then analyzed by a computer and then we get a readout. All right. I'm looking at UV Viz here. It's based on wavelengths on the UV invisible spectrum. All right. So let's say we have a sample that's in the blue. All right. So we have a little sample here in the blue. Now we know a particular compound gives off a certain wavelength, all right? So we're blasting it with light. Well, we know it's blue, so that could be a combination of lots of different compounds. But if we want to isolate it to a single wavelength, then we have this monochromator, and then it goes through this little sample. We shoot the light through it, that wavelength goes through. So here is our detector. Our detector is going to be like our monitor that gets the information. 
All right, you remember, and then we talked about our governor, our our controller, our brain. Our brain, in this case, is the amplifier, and the readout is the signal converted into something that we can read. All right, so that is an example of instrumentation in regards to cybernetics, and this is kind of what it looks like, the readout. Um, so the UV vis spectrum in this case is of gold nanoparticles and then we have a transmission electron microscopy image and then we also have size distribution. So this is kind of the boring part of it but we'll get to the application. So instrumentation we've got all of this. So we've got the wavelength spectrum. We've got what it looks like from electron microscopy and then we also have the size distribution. So we have all of these different types of readouts from cybernetics in that regard. Now let's get to bionic hands. <laughs> Prosthetics. Prosthetic studies can include, they basically include brain to prosthetic movement. All right, so this is cybernetics in regards to bionic hands, getting your brain signals translated into movement. So this is a pretty cool video here that I have. This is the, the medium to large size from B Bionic, um, one of the leading producers of prosthetics. And then we have a pretty cool video here of what it looks like when it's in motion. So it's translating brain signals to hand movement. If I can get this video to go. It takes forever. So essentially the whole thing is translating EEG to movements. And we're going to talk about brain stuff. So here we've got B Bionic Grip Patterns. This is one of the videos from their website where you can go and you can purchase um, Bionic hands. They're not very inexpensive, I, I fear. They're, they're kind of on the expensive side. So this is what it looks like. They've got, and it's based on skeletal structures as well. So it has individual finger movement, not just whole hand like the initial research would have. So you're able to grip with opposable thumbs where you can do two, you can do three, you can do all of these different types of movements based on just brain waves. So this is kind of cool. That's an interesting way to hold a knife. It's how I hold my keys when I go to my car, you know. But we're so much further along than we have been in the past. So that's essentially really cool. We won't spend all three minutes here. But there you go. I wanted to give you a little bit of information as to regards to what we have with prosthetics. Now let's talk about really cool stuff. Downloading thought. We can do brain to brain interface now. We can hook up brains together and transmit information. And so with the brain to brain interface, this study was done in 2013 at a Harvard University and the link to the article is listed below. It's all about small steps. It is. There's so many applications of cybernetics. I don't think people realize just how much there is out there. Um, so when we're dealing with brain to brain studies, this particular study um, first had brain to computer interface, then it had computer to brain interface. And this is wireless from humans to rats, all right? So the whole model of the experiment essentially was to translate brave wave, brave brain wave functions, send it through a computer to a receiver, then that receiver then goes through another computer to an interface to a rat. Oh, hello, hello. <laughs> so, um, so what we're looking at here is a person thinks, move your tail, rat, and then translates that through to, well, sends that to the computer. The computer then translates the EEG, that's in, in electrical encephalocardiogram, or EEC, EEG, yes, in electroencephalograph. <sighs> brain waves to the receiver. The receiver then sends that signal to the rat and the rat wiggles its tail. This is what we call brain to brain interface. There's no, in the FUS in this case is what we call the transcranial focused ultrasound. All right, so that is attached to the rat. 
the rat's tail moves and that's how they're able to actually send signals through computers to another brain from one brain to another they're actually able to do this as well with video games with people so they can send these signals through the internet to another person with the same brain waves and it causes them to move their finger on a particular video game so this is pretty cool now let's talk about some more cool stuff remote surgery so there's world-renowned surgeons that can't actually travel all the time to all kinds of places but if they have remote surgery this allows them to interact with their patients and to be able to perform surgery in another part of the world so on the left we see the actual digital screen all right, the digital screen to where a doctor can look at the patient or another healthcare provider can actually look at what's going on with the surgery. And then we have the actual patient side surgery. Well, their work where it's actually performing the surgery while the doctor could be in another country in another part of the world. Now this comes to us from intuitivesurgical.com. That's a particular company that does this type of surgery. Let's have a look what it looks like up close. So here we have um, doctors with their, it looks like they're like all involved in like a, almost like a video game, doesn't it? They're all involved in this. And so they're working on, you know, do, performing the surgery. And then we have a health care worker next to the patient with the patient side apparatus that's performing the surgery. And then you have the digital screen for anybody who's, you know, observing the surgery or watching for other types of things to be shown right there on the screen. So it's helpful. This is what remote surgery looks like. So in coordination with other healthcare workers, skilled surgeons from all over the world can now perform safe surgery on any individual. So this is pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool, isn't it? All right, now let's talk about the military. <laughs> Cybernetics, as far as control systems, are quite um, influential in military operations, especially with unmanned ships. So this is unmanned piloting to where we have other types of, um, you know, drones and, you know, to deliver hopefully food and water, but that's not always the case with the military. This is what one looks up looks like up close. So this is an MQ-9 Reaper. It has a nose camera. It has multi-spectral targeting systems including camera and sensors. This is where we get a lot of geolocation. Hello everyone! So we have geolocation involved. We have um, V-shaped tail for improved stability and there's also weapons including GPS and laser targeting types of bombs and missiles. So we're getting very more cybernetic in regards to remote control type of operations and including something called geolocation. This is actually pretty important, especially when you consider it with space. Okay. Hi! Hello! So when you're dealing with um, trying to figure out whether or not a particular target is human, chemical weapon, um, is it a ship, is it a gun? Is it what is it exactly? So geolocation is another form of cybernetics, which actually also includes a bit of that radar aspect we were talking about with um, Wiener and his studies initially with the World Wars, trying to make it more sensitive to where you would be able to find this is this, we know this is a tank and that is a person over there. Let's not hit that. Let's hit the tank. So that's what geolocation kind of does. And also when you're dealing when you incorporate it into space because now they're looking at um, having a whole separate military space operation to be able to determine whether or not a particular thing is um, a satellite or is it a comet that adds a whole new level of sensitivity with cybernetics so to kind of sum up this big giant thing cybernetics essentially is 
communications and automatic control systems in both machines and living things. Now customarily in Hollywood we see the mix of both. We see the Borg, we see the Cybermen, we see the Terminators, we see Johnny Mnemonic with downloading data into our brains, but it's not so much that. The, the um, definition of it essentially means anything that can translate it or make our lives a bit easier in regards to calculations, control systems, and it's based heavily on what we would consider our central nervous system. Seeing information, processing information, and then getting a desired outcome. That's essentially what cybernetics is. So it's interdisciplinary. We see it in medical applications communications like from brain to computer. We see it in military. We see it in any science theory. A lot of pure science uses computational methods that require cybernetics in order for us to see how things work on a quantum level. We can do that with computational methods, with all of these Schrodinger equations and these very compli complicated calculations. We can see how things are going to react over a period of time because of this environmental science. We can use it in environmental science. I know a lab that's working on trying to detect certain types of elements in the air using drones. <laughs> Instrumentation to be able to find particular things using drones. I mean this is the thing. And also in any kind of computer science you're going to find cybernetics. It's not very cheap <laughs> because it's we're constantly using new forms of cybernetics that require a lot of funding and research, but the cost could decrease over time as we see a lot with technology, as we find faster ways and more improved ways to make things. And it will likely continue to have influence on just about every aspect of our lives. So this has been the science of cybernetics. You can see, <laughs> I like this, this is a pretty cool gift. So you can find me on patreon.com slash scientist Mel. And I want to thank my patrons. Even if you just give me a dollar a month, you have no idea how helpful that is to me. Because I have my patrons here, I'm able to up the quality of my broadcast, be able to spend more time doing this. Um, so I want to thank Tony. I have an anonymous that wants to remain anonymous, Jen and Carl and Patrick for being patrons, and I also have special rewards just for my patrons that get early access to things and all kinds of other neat things that are just for, for them. Um, you can find me here. I'm all over social media. <laughs> So you can find me on Scientist Mail, patreon.com slash Scientist Mail. The only thing that's weird, I also have a WordPress. I'm writing a thing on depression right now. And YouTube is weird. Science email. They didn't have Scientist Mail available, so that's pain in the booty. But, you know, facebook.com, I'm there as well. And I'm working on my own website, and I should have an audio podcast soon. So you can download and get your science on every week in that. So that'll be fun. So if you guys have any questions, you can hit me up here anytime. Hey Scientist Mill on Twitter is the best way to get me with the hashtag because my ats fill often a whole lot. So um, use that hashtag and ask me any kind of science question that you want. So this has been Cybernetics. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. It's a bit dry at the beginning, so if you hopped in on the end, that's where all of the meat of stuff is with the cool fancy stuff. But at the beginning, we talk a bit more about the history of cybernetics and who the father of it is. And he was a child prodigy, really smart mathematician. So check that out. And thank you for hopping on. This has been fun. I hope you guys have a super awesome Saturday. I'm going to post the next poll for what you want to talk about for the next show. It was pretty close. I might just do, because it was a three-way tie on the last poll. <laughs> I might just pick one of those because it was really close. But thanks again. And if you have any questions, again, hit me up on Twitter. Thank you. You guys have an awesome day. And I guess I shall see you around on Twitter. Ah, thank you.